Hello, hackers. Today I want to talk about Project APS, which is one of many quote unquote dream computer projects of mine. And this project has a model of maximum flexibility with minimum hardware. It's based on the observation that some of the modern fantasy consoles like the TIC80 or the Pico 8 are actually more limited in terms of hardware than a modern retro computer project like the X16. And people still make great gains for these platforms. Therefore, the idea occurred to me that it may be possible to create a system that is not as powerful as the X16, but still being very versatile and allow people to do fun things with it. So before we start, let's get the elephant out of the room. What does APS stand for? It actually stands for absolutely pointless system or Andy's pointless system. I will address the problem of why it's pointless at the end and I'll give it a chance of realization low to medium. This is the thing I give to each of my computer projects. And I'll also explain the reason why it has a low chance of ever seeing the light of day at the very end of this video. Now, some people may ask, why do I come up another computer project when I already have the hack? And that's because I've actually been wanting to make a competitor to the X16 since day one. And by day one, I mean the first video in the AB Guys Build My Dream Computer series. And for a long time, that thing has been the hack. It's a powerful Z80 computer, it has protective mode, it can do all of these things that no other AB computers can do. But as I have explained in my arms race video, the hack is not going to cut it. It is just too cumbersome to be a fast gaming machine. So although it will be developed eventually, while I'm fighting with thousands of bugs and edge cases within the protection system of the hack, I'm also looking out for other designs and ideas. And I've got a lot of them. Most of them are not so great. Those computers are either too powerful so they are not that retro or the hardware specs are unbalanced for example it has something like 16 megabytes of ram on a 1 megahertz 6502 but i think this one is interesting enough to make a video about so without further ado let's look at the specs the cpu is a z80 at 5.37 megahertz running with zero weight state. Therefore, it's around 1.5 to 1.8 times faster in terms of pure CPU performance than an MSX. It has 60 KB of RAM, 32 KB of ROM, plus cartridge, which can be 32 KB usually, but it can also be expanded. Sound is provided by a Yamaha YM2203, the sound chip found in PC88 computers, it does 3-channel FM and 3-channel PSG. The PSG part is compatible with the sound chip used in the MSX and the later Spectrum that makes porting games over a bit easier. The graphics chip is a custom FPGA. I know some people just click away the moment they see the letters FPGA, but hear me out. FPGAs are not inherently bad, but when used in retro computing, they are usually overpowered. When designing a retro system, it's so easy to select an FPGA that it will perform better if you just write a RISC-V soft core into it and allow it to run at something like 100 megahertz. But the reality is, computer companies of the past can design their custom chips, like graphics and sound chips, while we retro enthusiasts cannot. Even if we can design those chips, there's no way to get them fabricated on the old processes that the old chips were fabricated on. FPGAs help even out the playfield for the computer designers in the 21st century. So let's talk about the graphics. Resolution is 256 by 192, variable to 256 by 240. And the color palette is 256 color out of 32,000. The graphics is composed of two independently scrolling layers with 16 colors each and 64 sprites. The sprites can be 8x8 or 16x16 and each can have 16 colors, selectable from 8 different palettes. There is also a text mode that gives you 16 color for the column text. And this system also does some bitmap at 16 color or 256 color, but there's only one bitmap layer. 
and the VRAM is 64 kibibytes, running at a 10.74 MHz clock, or three times the NTSC color burst frequency. Out of the two layers of this graphics system, the foreground layer is the main tile layer. It has a tile attribute entry as below. It does only tiles. It uses 8x8 tiles, no 16x16 or any other tile shape. It can do 15 colors plus transparent. It can use 4 pages of 32x32 32 32 tile map. This is your pattern layout table for MSX programmers or name table for Nintendo programmers. The entire VRAM can host 2048 tile patterns, which are 32 bytes each, and all of them are usable by the foreground layer. In addition to that, the foreground layer can also flip the tiles horizontally, but not vertically, and there's no rotation. There are also four palette bits within the foreground layer tile descriptor that allow you to select one of the 16, 16 color palettes from the 256 color main palette. Of course, only 15 of that is usable, but the other color is not wasted, and we will talk about that later. Coupling with the foreground layer are sprites. And there are 64 sprites in total, and all of the attributes are stored within the VDP itself. This is quite different from the approach used by MSX, computers, and I think also the Vera. However, this saves a massive amount of VRAM bandwidth, because now the VDP doesn't have to scan the memory for sprite attributes each line. Also, it offers a more direct way for the CPU to manipulate the sprite attributes. There is an early clock bit within the attributes that allowed hiding the sprite to the left of the screen. This is also the technique used by Texas Instruments on their TMS9918 chip. Sprites are 16 colors or 15 colors plus transparency, and 3 palette bits allow the sprite to use 8 out of 16 palettes. The priority bit within the sprite attribute allow the programmers to hide the sprite behind the foreground layer, but not the background layer. The size bit select each sprite to be 8x8 or 16x16. And to be clear, this option does not scale the pixels of the sprite. It actually allows the sprite to use more pixels for its graphics. The sprite number allowed programmers to select one of 256 patterns for the sprites. The patterns can be flipped horizontally or vertically. And finally, one unique feature of this system is that sprites are split into two collision groups. Within the collision groups, no collision detection will be performed. You can think of this as a player group and an enemy group in something like a shooter game. If the enemies collide with themselves, usually nothing happens within the game. But if an enemy collides with the player, or the player's bullet collides with the enemy, action should be taken by the CPU. The other layer on the APS graphics system is the background layer. The background layer can be set to bitmap mode. It can have 16 color or 256 color. The 256 color bitmap mode is usually for displaying things like cutscenes or still images. What is special about this layer is that the 16 color mode use color 0, 16, 32, and so on, all the way up to 240. And these colors are the transparency color of each palette. So these colors cannot be used by the foreground layer or the sprites. By using those colors for the background, the programmer can utilize the 256 color palette more efficiently. The background layer can also be set into a tile mode. And this tile mode is much simpler than the foreground tile mode, as the background in a game is usually much simpler than the foreground. This tile mode uses one byte for each tile, totaling 256 tile patterns. And each of those tiles share the same palette of 16 colors. These colors are taken from the transparency color of the foreground tile mode and sprites, just as a 16 color bitmap mode. And finally, both bitmap and tile background layer sports scrolling. But due to VRAM limitations, scrolling is limited in the bitmap modes. There may also be a 256 color tile mode, although I don't see a lot of use for that. It does allow more versatile allocation of colors. And finally, we have the text layer. This is not an actual layer because it shares the same layer priority with the background. This mode displays 40 column text with 16 foreground color and 16 background color. And these, again, are the same 16 colors used for the 16 color bitmap and tile modes for the background. Therefore, you can choose the color of your text independently from the color you choose for your foreground and sprites. 
When the text layer is displayed, all foreground and background graphics are turned off. You can think of this as the text layer have a higher priority than foreground, but sprites with high priority can still show over the text layer. The text layer can be placed above or below the background layer. Note that the above or below is not a description of display priority, but literally is positioned on the screen. Now you might wonder why do I include such a strange combination of two modes on the same layer? Well, this is actually very versatile. I will give you two examples. First, you can use it for basic. The graphics mode and high resolution graphics mode can coexist with text modes on the Apple II. This allows the programmers to see their program and the result of the graphics operations they are performing at the same time. I find that very useful when debugging graphical programs in BASIC. And the second use case is you can use the text layer as a status bar in games, just like the window layer on the Genesis or the Game Boy. And that's basically it for a description of the entire graphical subsystem. There are some registers I haven't touched on to read and write VRAM and set increment and stuff. But this is all regarding the design of the display engine itself. And here's some bonus content. This part is literally designed when I'm making this presentation. And the idea is simple. If you find 256 simultaneous on-screen colors a bit too much for an 8-bit system, I can reduce it to 64 and make the color selectable from a palette of 256 instead of 32,000. This requires a reduction of foreground tiles and sprites to 4 colors instead of 16 colors. And the deletion of 256 color bitmap mode or tile mode for the background. An added benefit of this design is that it halves the VRAM requirement for the system. And if you want to imagine how this will look like, I would describe it as a master system with a Famicom slapped onto it, but it has more colors and better sprites. Moving on from graphics, let's talk about the memory map of my APS. The entire 64 KB address space is divided up into 8 chunks of 8 KB each. And all of those chunks are banked between ROM and RAM. The first half of the ROM space is system firmware and basic. I presume it will be like 8 KB for the system firmware and 24 for basic. Therefore, on a purely game-oriented system, only 8 KB of system ROM will be needed. And the upper half of the address space is used by cartridge. And that cartridge space can be extended with the use of a mapper. Of course, the actual organization of the mapper can be arbitrary. You can put memory expansion there, or you can even put battery backed up SRAM for game saves. And that's all about the memory stuff, let's talk about I.O. The 256 ports of the Z80 is divided up into 4 parts, and there are 64 ports in each of those sections. The first section is simply reserved for future use, and the next 64 ports addresses internal devices. 32 of them are used to address various ports on the VDP, 2 of them are used for the sound and I.O. chip, and in the computer variant of the system, some of them are used for printers, cassette, disk drives, and keyboards and stuff. The next 64 ports are simply unused, and the final 64 ports are used to address external devices located on cartridges. Think about sound expansion, memory members, that kind of stuff. And that is basically all there is about the hardware. Again, as I said, it is super, super simple. But why do I call it the pointless computer? It's actually because it's literally the weakest modern retro computer. Well, maybe the Aquarius Plus is less powerful, but there's little documentation on the Aquarius Plus, so I cannot confirm that. It is designed to blend in with computers from 1985 or 1987, it will be a strong competitor, yes, but there's nothing making it stand out like the Vera did to the X16. And talking about the X16, whatever the APS can do, the X16 or the Mega 65 or the Spectrum Next or the Aegon Lite can do better. Take the Commander X16 as an example. It has more channels in PSG and FM in terms of sound. The Vera literally covers all the video modes of the APS and some more and outputs a higher resolution. On top of that, the APS is not compatible with any existing systems, and compatibility is usually a big push for these modern retro systems. 
If you are not compatible, you are not going to attract people with nostalgic memory about their childhood computers. Despite all of this, the APS will not cost significantly less than the X16, because the majority of the cost lies within the manufacturing of a large PCB with a lot of discrete components. However, those are not the reason why I say this machine will likely not come out. It is actually because it's directly competing with another machine that I designed, which has a better CPU, more memory, better graphics, better sound, more bells and whistles like direct memory access, and it will cost about the same because a lot of those components are integrated into the CPU. And as the cherry on top, that machine will be mostly compatible with both the MSX and the heck. However, that's the topic for another video. If you want me to do a description on that system, please leave a comment in the comment section below. If you have a suggestion about this or any other system I propose, you can send me a message by Patreon or join our Discord server. And of course, you can subscribe to my channel for more contents like this. But that's it for this video. I'm Andy, and I will see you in the next one.